Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Simon Ng, BEC's Director of Policy and Research. A warm welcome to the BEC and Rural Series online conference, Urban Transport on the Move, Connecting Policies, People and Business and, uh, Opportunities. Transport is an essential part of our daily life. In a dense and compact city like Hong Kong, we are facing unique challenges to keep people and goods moving while minimizing the impact on the environment and livability of the city. This is the first session of the conference, planning for a sustainable and people-centric urban transport system. To kickstart the event, I would like to invite our CEO, Mr. Adam Koo, to say a few words. Please welcome Adam. Distinguished guests and speakers, ladies and gentlemen, good morning and welcome to BEC's Enviro Series Conference. Since our last conference, held in July this year, we have experienced a few more COVID waves. In these extraordinary times, with social distancing and other pandemic control measures in place, we have taken the prudent step of taking our activities online. So for the first time since we began this event, the Enviro Series Conference has gone fully virtual. I would like to thank you all for joining us today to show your support. My deepest thanks and gratitude, first, must go to our sponsors and partners for their valuable contributions, which made this conference possible. I would also like to extend my sincerest appreciation to our distinguished guests and honorable speakers from around the world for taking time out of their busy schedule to join this conference. Your support and participation means the world to us. In early 2019, BEC undertook a strategic review and identified three environmental focus areas to concentrate our work around for the following three years. These are namely climate change, circular economy, and sustainable living environment. The last of the three, sustainable living environment, is a broad topic encompassing many subject matters related to the natural environment, such as air quality, water conservation, sustainable mobility, clean energy, green buildings, urban planning and design, among others. We recognize many of these topics are interconnected and see benefits in taking an integrated approach to understanding and addressing them. And as we live with the effects of COVID-19 and climate change, these topics become even more valid and pressing. Take urban transport as an example, one of the most important sectors in Hong Kong. It enables the movement of people and goods, facilitates Hong Kong's efficient commercial and business functions, and contributes to Hong Kong's economic performance. Transport supports people's mobility needs and gets them connected. However, unchecked growth in motorization, over-reliance on fossil fuel vehicles and a car-centric city planning culture will exacerbate the transport sector's impact on the environment. Talking about these issues is exactly why we are here today. Throughout the day, you will hear from a strong group of speakers from the government, academia, and across the industries to envision an urban transport system of tomorrow. We will be asking them to address four key areas. One, how we can re-engineer the system to deliver Hong Kong's vision of smart, sustainable, and resilient city. Two, share their future visions of private vehicles and public transport services under the new normal after COVID-19. Three, consider the role of technology and innovation like digitalization and IoT in urban mobility. And lastly, rethink the role of walking, cycling, and other modes of non-motorized transport I hope the discussions today will inspire us to re-examine the role of transportation in the urban landscape and how cities could be better planned so as to maintain the mobility functions while minimizing externalities such as air pollution, greenhouse gas emissions, and the loss of public space. In the long term, Hong Kong can look forward to a sustainable living environment which includes a much more climate resilient and future-ready urban transport system. Enjoy the conference today. Thank you. Thank you, Adam.
On behalf of Business Environment Council, I would like to thank our participants, supporting organizations, and most importantly, our sponsors, including CLP Power Hong Kong Limited, MTR Corporation, Shell Hong Kong Limited, the Hong Kong Electric Company Limited, and last but not least, the Hong Kong Jockey Club. Now, I would like to introduce our first speaker. Mr. Thomas Deloison is Director of Mobility of the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. Thomas is based in Geneva, and he cannot join us in Hong Kong today. But he is kind enough to record a speech for the conference, reflecting on urban mobility and sustainable development goals in the midst of COVID-19. Let's hear from Thomas. Good morning, and thank you for inviting me to this session. Current working norms prevent me to be physically with you today, but I am grateful for the opportunity to share my thoughts of the transformation of urban mobility with you. And thank you very much for the Business Environment Council to invite me as part of the NBO series. I also would like to express my gratitude to Constant Van Aerschot for taking a seat and represent WBCSD during the panel. We are truly at a unique time when it comes to urban mobility. In fact, 2020 feels more like a new era than the 2000s did. The pandemic is bringing economic disruption, but it is also accelerating existing trends. There are clear regionalization differences emerging in mobility. China and Southeast Asia taking a clear lead in electrification and digitalization. There are also several signals at the international level that are allowing us to hope for a very positive transformation of urban mobility system. Firstly, transport behaviors are changing. There is, for the first time in 70 years, the question of the need to go to work. And the working patterns of the world are being shocked by the pandemic and questioned by the leaders of business. The local economy also is, is striving with the emergence of the five minute or 15 minute trip in the, the urban planning policies of many cities of the world. Active mobility is clearly a winner from the various lockdowns, whether it is walking, cycling, we have seen rise of active mobility in almost every city of the world over the last six, eight months. The pandemic also brings acceleration of technology adoption. First with electrification of vehicles, it's booming. China is in the leading seat and is poised for exponential growth in the next decade. Vehicle to grid technology and battery swaps, along with vehicle electrification, offer ways to reconsider the intersection of mobility and energy. Digitalization is also accelerating. There is the opportunity for integration of digital services for ticketing, identification, and multimodal options in every transport system of the world. And the adoption of this technology is on the rise, supported by the telecommunication technologies and the new network capacities that are forecasted to come, especially with 5G. Finally, we see many policy signals and they are very encouraging. China, Japan, Europe, all strive for carbon reductions and carbon commitments towards 2050 or 2060. And there are some positive signs in the US. These positive signs from the policymakers offer hope for taking concrete actions as fast as possible. So the decade ahead is really critical in transport and in urban mobility, which is at the center of decarbonization. The acceleration of technology introduction and the parallel political leadership will help us to address the climate imperative and allows us to have some positivism for the decade, the decade ahead when it comes to achieving the SDGs, but it gives no space for latency in actions. It's time to drive collective actions starting with a collective vision for a clean, safe and efficient mobility for all that will help align the interests of the various sector and foster collaboration. The private sector must take leadership to help repurpose urban mobility systems towards sustainability, starting by making the urban mobility system cleaner. Urban passenger transport demand 
could increase up to 100% by 2050 globally, with a 450% increase in Asia alone. Electrification in urban environment, including sharing, is simply a climate and public health imperative in this region. A fast adoption of electric vehicle technology, combined with ambitious policies and a rich product offer, um, provide us with an opportunity to foresee an increase of 75% or up to 75% of new car sales to be electric by 2040, and perhaps much sooner for light commercial vehicles. This will only be possible if the charging network is fit for purpose. Fleet operators, energy and utility providers, infrastructure and real estate players must collaborate to create the new business models that will help to scale purposeful and economically viable charging infrastructure while supporting the energy transition. The business can help overcome the problem of interoperability while collaborating to propose new financing schemes and partnership models that help to aggregate all services around the electric charging service stations, fostering social inclusion while accelerating the use of renewable energy and helping the energy transition. Such collaboration can help repurpose and redesign dense urban environments while creating shared value. We also have to collaborate to make the urban mobility system safer. Road accidents remain a disease that we struggle to cure. With globally 1.4 million deaths per year, we need to act now. The vision for road safety, where technology and the paradigm change of design in, is embedded in the next decade for action at the United Nations. A shared set of policy guidelines that help integrate every transport mode in a safe system will help to encode the current shift of behaviors to active modes while designing vehicles and infrastructure to prevent the risk of injury or death in the urban environment, especially for the vulnerable population. Technology can also help to achieve the common objective of casualties reductions with new sensors, geofencing, and of course, automated driving. All of that integrating the new ways of uh, answering or responding to emergency situation. In this field, business leaders must help to redefine the habits and the operations of corporate users on the road to shift the collective mindsets towards safety. Let's talk about efficiency for a second. Efficiency gains exist at every corner of urban mobility systems. We should co collectively strive for the maximization of assets, be it a vehicle, street space, buildings, metro cars. We need to maximize the usage. All of that to reduce our need for resources, whether it be energy, material, or simply time. There are important economic and social opportunities associated with these ideas along the entire value chain. If we harness the new value pools created by change of ownership patterns, the so-called everything as a service, and we have to focus on data as the common denominator of this change. In this field, the private sector can lead the change by advocating constructive and collaborative data sharing for the creation of shared value for people, for the planet, and economic value. Together, local communities can harness the benefits of mobility data sharing through new forms of governance and partnerships in mobility that are bespoke and dedicated to each local needs. Finally, we do not want to uh, forget about inclusivity and equality. We should not lose sight of the danger of inequality in transport, especially in light of the pandemic and the corresponding economic crisis. The most vulnerable populations are often those who must use public transit and will need particular care and specific incentives so that they can access work and education. Business as a corporate citizen and an employer also has the responsibility to provide access to work in the most sustainable and the most efficient way and most financially, financially inclusive way to its employees. We encourage every business leader to consider the topic of inequality as an integrated part, integrated part of the sustainable corporate mobility policies that they will implement. I would like to conclude by reminding all of us that it is our collective responsibility 
to advocate and practice change. In the midst of the pandemic, there are large opportunities for reshaping urban mobility systems, to provide the innovation, to show leadership in behavior change, and to advocate for ambitious policies that will help drive change fast. Thank you very much again for your attention, focus, and support for making urban mobility cleaner, safer, more efficient, and more inclusive together. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas, for setting the scene nicely for the rest of the conference. Coming next, we would like to turn our focus to Hong Kong. How can we plan for a sustainable living environment which ultimately improve people's living standards and enhance their well-being? I'm very pleased to have Mr. Ivan Chung, Deputy Director of Planning of the Hong Kong SAR government, as our second speaker. Ivan, the floor is yours. Good morning. Uh, thanks, uh, BEC invitations to today's conference. First, I think uh, no one will dispute the importance of sustainable development in that our present needs should not preempt the needs of our future generations to meet theirs. We could go for a sustainable living environment by reducing the use of natural resources and carbon footprint in our transportation, energy and resources consumption. To achieve this, town planning can promote sustainable living environment by creating resource-efficient, clean and healthy cities. First of all, at the strategic planning level, we have uh, the Hong Kong Tool Field Plus setting out a vision that Hong Kong should become a livable, competitive and sustainable Asia's world city and we champion the sustainable development as our overarching planning goal. There are three building blocks underpinning our strategy that is planning for a livable, high density city, embracing new economic challenges and opportunities, and creating capacity for sustainable growth. An integral part of this uh, strategy is the pursuit of a screen, smart, and resilient strategy. Smart means utilizing technology to make city more intelligent and efficient in the use of resources. Green means lessening environmental impact and carbon footprint without compromising development capacity. Resilient means we can reduce damages and risks from disaster and our ability to bounce back to our stable state quickly. Against such a strategic planning framework, there are two major transport issues we are now facing. They are home job imbalance and the growth of vehicles. We can share uh, some initial views or thoughts on these two issues. This slide shows the current situation of home job imbalance in Hong Kong. I think uh, no one will dispute that our urban core, or what we call the metro area, comprising Hong Kong Island, Kowloon Peninsula, Chin Man Kui Ting, uh, are now taking up the lion's share of, of job opportunities in Hong Kong. As shown on this slide, the census figures show that apart from the foreign domestic helpers and or working population without a fixed place of work like taxi drivers, there's nearly a total of 2.9 million working population in Hong Kong. For those residing in the metro area, about 1.7 million, nearly 90% of them work in the metro area. But for the people living in the NT, about 1.2 million working population living in the NT, this slide shows that over 50% of them have to travel to the metro area to work. Such a phenomenon of cross-district commuting shows that a large proportion of people living in the NT are not supported by local employment. The price we have to pay is that the one-way commuting pattern from the NT to the metro area during the morning peak hours and vice versa during the evening peak has created immense pressure on our transport infrastructure. A lot of traffic has been introduced by home job spatial imbalance with a lot of people having to travel from the NT to the metro area to work. The situation will worsen if we do nothing. Home job spatial imbalance also puts pressure on the transportation system in Hong Kong. Also long commuting also degrades our quality of life and reducing the time we can spend with our family. Bringing jobs closer to homes and promoting a more balanced spatial development pattern a major considerations underlying the formulation of our strategic plan as well as planning of individual new development areas. The second issue is about the car growth in the past years. Since year 2000, the average annual growth of our public cars, about 2.9% per year, has far exceeded that of the total vehicles, about 2.3%. While public car ownership in Hong Kong is still very low by international standards, but unchecked growth 
will likely or surely add burden to the already overloaded transport network and call for additional parking space. The issue of car growth is coupled or made more complex by the issue of relatively slow growth in our, the length of our highway built over the same period. Growth of vehicles has also exceeded that of population and domestic households. From about uh, 1999 to last year, vehicles uh, growth increased annually, as I said mentioned, about 2.3%, uh, about from 0 0.5 million to nearly 0 0.8 million. But population growth only increased by 0.6%, from 6.6 .6 million to 7.5 million. This results in a significant increase in the vehicle ownership rate from 252 per 1,000 households in 1999 to about 300 in 2019. We looked at many car owners, maybe holiday drivers, and their trips to work mainly on the, on the public transport. The overall demand for private vehicles may also uh, decrease in the long run in view of the projected trend of slower growth in our population and households, as well as the increasing population proportion of the aged population. That said, we still see the lead or importance to promote urban mobility while managing vertical growth full-time planning. Uh, that set out the spatial framework uh, proposed under Hong Kong TO Field Plus. In that, uh, we propose a framework to guide the future growth areas and the development of supporting transport infrastructure. One of the underlying considerations is to achieve a more balanced territorial development pattern by decentralizing economic activities and bringing jobs closer to home. We propose uh, we will have one metropolitan business core covering our existing CBD in Central, also the second CBD in Kowloon East, and the first CBD we propose on the East Lantern Metropolis or the Gao Yizhou Artificial Islands. Another strategic growth area we propose is in the anti-North, the New Territories North, to decentralize the future growth of population or the provision of jobs. Under our Hong Kong Tool Field Plus, these two strategic growth areas are to cater our future housing needs as well as further mitigate home job imbalance. On the East Lantern Metropolis, we emphasize potential population and employment opportunities. In particular, the first CBD will have synergy effect with our CBD in Central as well as Lantern development. Uh, we preliminary estimate we could create about uh, 200,000 jobs in the new CBD. For the anti-north, we emphasize the land, we could uh, use it or put it into modern logistics or other special industrial uses at the boundary location, which will create substantial job opportunities, also over 200,000. Through the creation of more job opportunities covering different spectrums, we believe that there will be a better prospect to create a more home job balance in these new growth areas. In parallel, we can or we should step up our efforts to ensure high-performance urban mobility through a two-pronged approach, that is, to promote a more comprehensive transport infrastructure, as well as actively managing traffic through different means. All along, uh, in planning our new towns or new development areas, we have been encouraging the use of public transport to reduce the reliance on public vehicles. At the moment, Hong Kong has a very efficient and sophisticated public transport system. Uh, nearly by uh, last year, about 90% of the daily passenger trips were made by public transport. Amongst these trips, over 40% were made by railway. We will aim to increase the use of uh, public transport by creating greater capacity and enhancing the services of public transport. It seems I can move to the next slide. Oh, yes, it's okay. Uh, currently, rail share of the passenger trips by public transport is over 40% and will be increasing. In the uh, LDS 2014, the government has already set out our aim to expand our current uh, network uh, to serve a wider public or to serve more areas within Hong Kong. We have uh, three major railways now in the pipeline uh, will be soon implemented by the government. Uh, they including the NOL, the Lofton Link, linking the East Vale and the West Vale, the Tumun South extension, as well as the Dong Chong Line extension. 
Alongside the road-based transport modes, we should advocate walking and cycling to mitigate traffic congestion and gas emission, and hence reduce the impact on the environment. Comprehensive and integrated uh, pedestrian network and cycle tracks should be planned and implemented, which will help to, to facilitate our smart mobility by the public. Hong Sui Kyo, a uh, Hachun new development area, is a good example to illustrate how our urban mobility can be implemented or enhanced through better land use planning, including we have railway as our backbone of transport development, as well as concentrating population and key economic activities within the walking distance of the station and providing an environmentally friendly transport service and to promote smart mobility, including our comprehensive walking and cycle track network. In planning for the compact rail-based development, we have high-density developments concentrated around the Hong Sui station. Public uh, transport interchanges have been planned within the NDA to facilitate multimodal transport. And also, we have over 90% of the population will be residing within the rail station or the environmentally friendly transport system. Uh, Hong Sui Kyo, we will also fool the provision of different economic activities or land uses to create a wide spectrum of job opportunities with the magnitude about 150,000 job opportunities to serve the future population. The provision of environmentally friendly transport services, which may be uh, in the form of a uh, green minibus, uh, sorry, uh, maybe in the form of electric bus, light bus, or light rail, will serve the different activity nooks within the areas. The total length of the EFTS will be about 10 kilometers. And also we have a comprehensive uh, walking and cycle track network to connect all the areas within the NDA to facilitate smart mobility. But we, can all, we should not over, uh, lose sight of the need or importance of making better use of the information and communications technology to promote smart, uh, and smart walking or smart mobility within the area, like we have the new proposed new traffic management measures or innovative means uh, to facilitate crossing or walking within the NDA. But it will be never an easy task to achieve the vision and planning initi initiatives as presented in my presentation. Lying ahead are different challenges we need to face head on, including how to ensure policy and administrative support, how to ensure the feasibility uh, of the proposed uh, planning proposal like the EFTS, as well as how to allow feasibility of our land use only system to cater for the future economic activities. I think uh, the future has to rely on the concerted efforts of both the public and private sectors. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ivan, for sharing with us a vision and a planning flooring work for Hong Kong at the strategic level, which emphasizes being green, smart, and resilient. You also mentioned a few key words such as vision-driven, action-oriented, capacity creation, and most important of all, people-centric. Now, I want to switch from the city level to how we can create a people-based community. Hong Kong has long been a world leader in urban transportation. Transport planners and operators and policymakers have been coming to Hong Kong to learn from our success, our efficient public transport system, and how we integrate transport and city planning. One of the most coveted success story is transit-oriented development in a high-density setting. Our third speaker is Mr. Steve Yu, Principal Advisor, Property Planning of the MTR Corporation. He is a renowned expert in this subject area, and I cannot wait for his sharing. Please welcome Steve. Thank you, Simon. Uh, hello, everyone. Sustainability is a big word. There's been a lot of talking about it, but how to put it into practice is a real question. Um, there's a very interesting quote here. Transit-oriented development is at the very heart and soul of sustainability, and that describes the situation in Hong Kong very well. In the past, 
few decades, Hong Kong has been building quite a number of TLDs, transit-oriented developments. And life in Hong Kong gradually evolves around MTR. Despite the rapid population growth and economic growth, Hong Kong only built on 25% of our land. And 90% of passenger trips are made on public transport. This is an amazing achievement. Thanks to the government's planning policy based on the TOD approach, Liu railway lines are not planned to serve the transport functions alone, but also um, serve as development corridors. And around each station, development clustered around it within the walking catchment and connecting to the station by a station integrated development about the station and usually a public transport interchange. Um, this last mile is very important to provide the convenient access to the station, critically important to the success of the TOD approach. MTL in its network uh, have built about half uh, uh, of the station this kind of development and amounting to 9 million square meters to date and 4 million square meters in the pipeline. They bring along many economic, environmental, social and financial benefits, which I don't uh, think I should elaborate uh, too much to, uh, today because today I would like to focus on the topic, how to implement these TODs. TOD projects actually, or TOD-like projects, are not a new thing. 200 years ago, you can find streetcar suburbs. They have all those features we see in TOD development today, and followed by developments along metro lines in New York, in London, uh, and in a big way in Japan. But, um, well, it's mainly market-driven. It's quite straightforward that a railway company bought some land to build a line and build properties around the station, uh, use the property profit to fund the project, to make it profitable. But as the land bank dries up and it finds that they found that it's so expensive to operate the railway system. So one by one, the railway lines was handed over to uh, the city authorities or, or the company, uh, uh, governments. Not until in the 1990s that um, Peter Kelthorpe coined the term transit-oriented development, that the interest in building TODs uh, was revived. And now you can see these developments in London, in New York, uh, Tokyo, and Sydney. But mostly in a different way. It's not market-driven anymore. It's policy-driven. The government wants to achieve sustainability uh, objectives. So um, they plan and implement the TOD projects. They face many implementation challenges. Putting railway together with other users on the same piece of land is not easy, especially now the railway company doesn't own the development right above the railway site, the, 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 the station site anymore. So how to align the interests of the railway company with other stakeholders uh, remains to be a very, very big issue. For Hong Kong, uh, back in 1975, government took the bold step to kind of uh, we established the same role of MTR uh, as the old railway companies, old private railway companies overseas. The MTR doesn't only build railway and operate railway alone, but we also build communities along the line. So under the so-called rail plus property model, uh, we integrate property with the railway facilities, whether it's a station or a depot so that we can 
create value from the site and capture the value. And from the development, it also increased the ridership so that um, together they help to plug the funding gap of railway projects. MTL played the role as a super connector to resolve all the uh, technical interfaces and administrative interfaces. So you may call MTL as the TOD uh, enabler. So how this TOD enabler would be able to make developments transit-oriented and people-based? Um, my suggestion is that um, it has to be business-oriented. Last year, I went to Chengdu. Um, my hotel is right next to a new station, some 300 meters away. But there's no direct connection to the this, to this station on the top right-hand corner, either through subway or footbridges. And then I have to go a detour a long way to go to the station in a quite hot weather, which I would not do. So the development is well, what we call transit-adjacent development, not transit-oriented development, and also I don't think it's people-friendly enough. In Hong Kong, we take a different approach, um, more business-oriented. For example, when we plan a railway line, um, we really apply the people-based approach in deciding the alignment and the station. The purpose is not to um, build the cheapest railway or to bring people to the destination as quickly as possible. The purpose is mainly to capture as many people uh, around the station and facilitate them to, them to get to the station as quickly, as convincingly as possible. Even uh, it's very difficult to do so. For example, in Chengyi, the station is put in the middle of the site, uh, having a lot of difficult challenges. Or routing the rail line through the development sites, as in the uh, case of Tongchong, there, uh, the station entrances would be positioned to serve the community. And these TOD developments, they are people-centric to create life and vibrancy and seamlessly integrated between the station and the development and the development and the laboring area. It embraces all the uh, TOD features like the so-called 3D density, diversity, and pedestrian-friendly design as um, promoted by Professor Robert Suferro, or um, three A's, accessibility, agglomeration, and amenity, as uh, mentioned by Peter Newman. So MTL is doing this not for charity, but it's value-driven. We have to produce products that uh, is marketable, and that to be marketable, it has to be people-based, that people would like to buy it, would like to go do shopping in it, would like to uh, move around in it. So these TOD developments would not be limby, not in my backyard, like in overseas that people do not welcome, but PIMBY, uh, please in my backyard, the term uh, used by Peter Lillman. So to do this, MTL uh, have to have two teams of um, professionals to do property and railway in parallel at different stages in planning, design, and construction. But you can see on the right-hand side that the institutional framework is more important in making TOD or good TOD developments happen. MTL um, has to do not only the railway but also property, and they do it according to commercial principles and that uh, government has to be the majority shareholder so that they will ensure that a high degree of corporate governance is being exercised 
and also the public interest is being looked after. So I'll show you some examples of uh, our TOD development, like a very big current station development is fully integrated from the station up to the uh, podium deck and the towers. Horizontal, vertical um, integration uh, has been doing uh, in great detail. And on this podium deck, a lot of open space is provided to, uh, uh, for the enjoyment of the public. Another example is um, Lohas Park, that this is MTL's biggest TOD development. You can see for the 50 towers, having 25,000 housing units, they are so well connected by a very elaborate walkway system to the station, to the shopping mall, and to all the facilities. Here we provide a convenient comeback and green living for uh, a population of some 70,000 people. And a small project I'd like to mention here is a Cheng Yi, uh, the Lorry Park and Public Transport Interchange. Before uh, the development or redevelopment took place, uh, this is how it looked like people had problem crossing the street at ground level to reach the station. MTL uh, devised a scheme to improve the uh, transport facilities to uh, uh, convert part of the, the lorry park to a shopping mall and bring people up to the, um, to the first floor level and go direct to the uh, uh, station. And open space for the public is provided uh, at the roof level. Well, this comes from commercial consideration, but it also brings many planning benefit to the community. So will there be any more TOD developments in the future? Uh, I hope yes, and I heard from Ivan that uh, uh, areas like Hong Sui Kiu, they're also planning uh, TOD developments uh, around the stations. So the model, uh, to integrate railway and property to provide sustainable communities works well for Hong Kong and bringing benefit um, to different sectors in the society, MTL, the development sector, the community at large, and to the government. For the future projects, um, how far would TOD developments go? Um, is yet to be uh, decided because uh, it's not without debate that uh, some people think, well, do we still want to have the rail as the backbone of the public transport or um, uh, MTR should just focus on railway operation and not to touch on any uh, property development in future. So all sorts of debate uh, in, the, in the town and that I think government decision will depend on uh, or will reflect what people think. Um, so I am very happy to, um, to listen to uh, views from uh, the floor, from other speakers today. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Steve. Um, please join me on the stage and take a seat. Thank you. So um, we've got all the presentations uh, in this session, and now we are moving on into the panel discussion session. Now, I think uh, we have about uh, 50 minutes, which is great. And now uh, joining me is, of course, uh, Ivan uh, from uh, the planning department, and also Steve uh, from the MCL Corporation. But also, uh, we have uh, Mr. Constant uh, van der Schott from uh, the um, World Business Council for Sustainable Development. He's uh, based in Singapore, and uh, he's a director of Asia Pacific uh, for WBCSD. Um, um, good morning, Constant, can you hear me? Yes, good morning, everyone, and I can hear you very well. Thank excellent, you for excellent. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, maybe, Constant, I, I will start with you. Um, can you say a few words about um, yourself, your work uh, with WBCSD? Especially, I know that, know that um, WBCSD actually have a team 
uh, working on urban mobility. And if you can say a few words about you know, your work, um, maybe also you know, your observation in Singapore, because Singapore is very much like Hong Kong, very dense, a lot of people, but in terms of transportation, it's also you know, very fascinating. So, um, Constant, please. Yeah, thank you very much. I just want to start to say that I'm a civil engineer. So uh, all the plans that you've seen uh, from earlier presentation, you really appeal to me. So I'm based in Singapore. I've been here for eight years. Uh, and WBCSD, as you said, is a, is a non-profit organization. And we have a mobility team. And you heard from our mobility director, Thomas Deloison, uh, in the opening speech uh, to set the scene. Um, uh, so the, how do you say, the transforming urban mobility project that uh, Thomas is, is running it has really is following four goals, very similar to the one that Hong Kong is, is looking at smart, green, and re resilient. So uh, the four goals of our project is safer, cleaner, more accessible, and efficient. So we are very, very much in line with this. Uh, and um, <clears throat> I've seen some numbers uh, from Hong Kong. So you said that you know, the, railway, the, the number of roads increase uh, is 0.6%. And uh, I've noticed that it's exactly the same in Singapore. Uh, it's the same number in terms of uh, how, how many more roads are being built uh, here in Singapore. Um, so I'd like to, to maybe uh, say a few words about uh, car ownership, uh, you know, because this is a big issue is the more cars you have, you know, the more congestion you have. And I'm coming from Switzerland <clears throat> and Geneva, and there, uh, the city planning is actually making car ownership more complicated rather than promoting. So a lot of policy initiative uh, have shifted from the 60s and 70s. For example, if you build a building, we used to have minimum car parking requirement. And now like in London and in other places, you have a maximum number to, 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 to make car ownership more complicated. And then it's all about making the alternative to car ownership more attractive. So I think these are the two main parts and we can discuss you know, how to make the, uh, the alternative more attractive. And then so of course, MTR and, and people-centric planning is key, but also make it, making it more difficult to own and operate a car. So I think it's, and there are tools to, to do this. Of course, in Singapore, you all know there's COE, it's very expensive to buy a car. I think in Hong Kong, it's very expensive to park a car. <laughs> I think you have the highest uh, uh, price ever for a parking lot being sold a few years ago. So that made the headlines. So, um, so these are the kind of the two, two kind of uh, points is making the alternative attractive and making car ownership uh, a little bit more difficult. Okay, um, thank you, Constant. Um, I think on your last point about parking, you are correct to say that parking is very expensive, um, only for private parking. But actually, for you know, uh, street level, on street parking, Hong Kong is perhaps one of the cheapest uh, in yes. the world. So I, I, I have to correct that point because that's very important, and that will have an impact on how people are, uh, you know, and uh, you know, considering uh, driving course because, you know, as they use a car. They consider the fuel cost, but they sometimes forget about you know parking cost because parking, as I said, on street parking is actually quite cheap in Hong Kong. So um, now, before I start my next question, I would like to you know um, let you all know that actually we have this morning more than a hundred uh, participants joining us. So I think this is a very good you know number, and they are also coming from different parts of the world. We've got uh, you know attendants uh, attendees coming from Australia, uh, Korea. And hopefully we'll have you know, more participants joining us from other parts of the world later in the day. Um, now, my second question is also related to Constant's uh, points about you know, how to make uh, driving maybe less attractive, but you know, making public transport more attractive. But how to connect uh, the planning of transportation with um, city planning? because that's you know, uh, hand in hand and that must be integrated. Now, um, maybe I will turn to uh, Ivan. Uh, in terms of you know, integrated 
uh, city and transport planning. I think Hong Kong has got a lot of experience. Um, and how can we, as we just discussed, shift the focus from cars to having much more focus on the need of people in that planning process? I think basically it relates to the change of our paradigm. Maybe in the past, uh, you see the uh, past development in our built area. The planning or development of a city somehow dictated by the uh, experience, say the con engineering experience or the easy implementation. So you, you have, we have the highways built along our most valuable waterfront. And the people are uh, basically some, somehow deprived of the, of the opportunity to have easy access to the waterfront. Uh, we are now doing work to uh, ratify the situations. But I think for the planning of the new development areas, say uh, in our Gudong North uh, or Fanen North NDA, we try to remedy the such a situations. Also, as mentioned in my presentation about Hong Sui Kyo NDA, we will have the uh, transport or the public transport, in particular the rail, as the backbone of the uh, public transport. And then we will plan most of the, say, the economic activities or the residential development concentrate around the station. That means people or the future residents there will have easy accessibility or mobility in connection with the new rail station. Of course, uh, we also ensure, uh, as I said before, the uh, good or well-planned uh, pedestrian network or cycle track network connecting throughout the new development areas. I think it now, I think uh, our attention or, or what to say, how is a more vision driven or planning driven to plan our new development areas. Okay, um, thank you, Ivan. Steve, um, now Ivan mentioned a uh, rail based uh, transport system. And, and that's why I want to turn to you, you know, with, I mean, working with a rail company and in the area of urban planning and, you know, property development, you talk about the R plus P model, uh, which is a, a great success. Um, how would you make sure that, you know, the integration is not just with the railway system, but also with other transportation modes, including, as Ivan just talked about, uh, you know, buses, mini buses, but also non-mechanized mode, active transportation, like walking and cycling, and how to make it work? Um, I think um, so far we have been doing quite well in Hong Kong. Um, for each station, there's always a PTI built next to it, such as here in Kalonton. I just looked around, and the PTI uh, connection to the station is very good. Connection to the um, shopping mall is very good. But Hong Kong, uh, I think, should observe the changes in the society more. For example, uh, these days, you can see in London more people using uh, a bicycle to go to work or wherever, and also scooter. Uh, Hong, in, in terms of walking, Hong Kong is, not, uh, is doing quite good, actually. Mm. But for other modes of transport, uh, we have to make some more substantial improvement. I think uh, the multimodal interchange in Hong Kong because we have the PDI, public transport interchange, um, being in the buses, mini buses, and taxis, uh, uh, already we are making uh, very good achievements, but we should not be complacent, uh, but expand to kind of slow uh, modes, like walking more better access um, to the station, and also um, bicycles and scooters. Okay, uh, thank you, Steve. Can you, can you tell us a little bit uh, of the experience uh, when you work in, say, mainland China or other Asian cities? Uh, because uh, some of the cities there are also very dense, but I think um, you know, other conditions may be different. So what are the challenges for them to, um, you know, to develop a, an integrated system, uh, so to speak? Well, let me first mention about China. The, uh, photo I showed to you that uh, TOD approach is a national policy, mm. okay? But in terms of implementation, they want TOD with cars. Mm. So that's the trouble. Um, like you look at uh, Chengdu, where I stay, uh, it's so close, but yet so far. Mm. So how to uh, make the railway company responsible for what they have done 
in Hong Kong, we take a business approach. Um, you need to make the uh, railway operation financially viable. Make the uh, uh, railway operation financially viable, and that you have to do it right at the planning and design stage. Mm. Um, well, it's also uh, quite inspiring that when I work in London uh, on a, a project, that I realized actually London uh, for major transport nodes, the parking ratio uh, in the London plan is zero. Mm. So it, I was surprised in Hong Kong, we do have parking, we do want to reduce the parking, but in London, they want no parking. If you want parking, you have to justify it. I think that's approach that uh, is an integrated government policy, not just one part of it. Mm. Okay, uh, thank you, Steve. I, I, I think I will come back to Ivan later about, you know, how should we move forward in terms of uh, government policy. Um, but, um, uh, Constant, um, can you tell us a bit more about, you know, Singapore? Because I know in the last few years, Singapore, they've put out like a car light, uh, you know, uh, strategy. You have a comprehensive strategy in terms of urban mobility. So, you know, and, and you know, you have a very similar urban setting like Hong Kong. Um, are they also, well, actually they are uh, doing a lot of TOD projects as well. But are there any, um, you know, features that are different uh, from, from Hong Kong? So that, that's my first question. But thinking broader in other cities that you've got experience with, like even European cities, you know, what are the challenges there? Can, can you shed some light? Thank you. Yeah. So uh, indeed, uh, so the government here in Singapore said, you know, they, they, they want to, to go for a car light society. Uh, and uh, they also made commitments uh, for electrification of, of cars. Uh, so by 2040. So but that, that's another topic because um, I think that what is common between Hong Kong and Singapore is, is a space issue, the lack of space. And that's very specific to, to those two, two cities that you probably see less in other cities where you have more, more space. Um, so that's why the problem of, of optimizing and making the transport efficient is, is very important. So there is a new trend, which you probably know about, is a mobility as a service. Mobility as a service is basically a joint digital channel uh, with a unita uni unified gateway to plan, book, pay mobility services. And, and then uh, you, Hong Kong has this uh, to some extent already and Singapore as well. But then uh, what we see more and more that uh, you need data in order to optimize mobility as a service. Now, the question of data is, is very important because private sector owns mobility data and the government owns and your know, public transport owns a lot of data. So to, to boost the, the concept of mobility as a service, you need to be able to uh, exchange between the private sector and the public sector, relevant data at, uh, on, uh, just in time, if you want, or simultaneously. So just discussing and agreeing on data sharing principles, who owns what data and who should share what data with whom for what purpose. So, uh, and, and this is more at the forefront. And, and once you do this, then you can develop your new services like mobility as a service. So I think that, that that's a bit the trend and, and unless government, you know, private and public agree on sharing a certain data, whether it's your know, traffic light or you know, bus arrival times and, and, and these things, uh, you, once this is done, then you can create new services and, and, and actually new business models as well. Okay, then um, are there any success cases, uh, successful cases in Europe, for example, in, in terms of uh, data sharing uh, and usage? Uh, th there are issues about privacy mm. uh, that slows down this progress, but that's, that's, let's say, it's the path going forward. So the answer is uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but that's what uh, is being now discussed very heavily. Mm. You know, uh, privacy issues in, Euro in Europe are a bit more const constraining than maybe in Singapore and, and, and other places. Uh, you know, people are less reluctant to share, you know, where they've been, et cetera, uh, in, in, in 
some parts of Asia as, as opposed to, to Europe. So, but, but it doesn't change the fact that we need to ensure that data is shared, private and public sector data. So, so that's a trend and the answer is no, you, you know, uh, there is um, kind of no kind of clear winners or best case at the moment. It's being discussed how to do this best. Okay, uh, thank you. Now, um, you, you talk about uh, data sharing, uh, working with different stakeholders. And I think my next question, maybe to first to Ivan, is, you know, as we all know, uh, we need to work with uh, different government departments and agencies, and, as, and also between the public sector and the private sector, in not just data sharing and, and utilization, but also in, in other aspects of, you know, a sustainable, uh, you know, uh, urban uh, system. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, Ivan, can you share uh, some of your experience so far uh, in terms of working with other uh, government departments like transport department? You know, I have to say, in the last few years, uh, I think this is uh, an area where a lot of improvements has been made. Um, but, you know, for, for us working in this particular transport and, you know, city planning field, we'd like to get more confidence from you uh, as this is a very important area for us to move forward together. So, Ivan, can you shed some light on this? Yeah, I, I think in terms of the urban transport or the urban mobility, the issues are very important issues, always duly uh, pay attention by the government or also by different departments. Uh, for the planning department, I, as I elaborate in my PowerPoint presentation, in planning um, new development areas, uh, we all, all aim to set out a good plan in terms of to facilitate a TOD development, uh, to set out a comprehensive network for transport and uh, uh, for the pedestrians. But also we have to look uh, to the other department support. Say uh, for the transport department, uh, for at the moment, they are doing different aspects to address the, the transport issues. First, the uh, workability study. I, I, I know that uh, they are now uh, proceeding with their workability study with a target or objective to improve uh, a good workable environment in the build-up area or in particular some already developed uh, overcrowded areas. I think uh, it is uh, not an easy task because whenever you, you proceed with some uh, or improvements in the build-up areas, you will have to come across different uh, problems like the land ownership issues and also how to get the agreements or consent from the, say, the uh, local council or different st stakeholders. That is uh, one issue. The second issue is the uh, car parking issues. I think we, we, we can't uh, evade this, uh, these issues because uh, as, uh, I think it is uh, quite a uh, common build uh, as transpired from uh, this morning uh, discussion is we need to control the, the car, private car parts. But I think um, the other issues is that whenever <laughs> Uh, the government departments go to the local council or district council or, uh, to get uh, meetings with the uh, local residents. One of the issues they always keep bombarding the government is the lack of car, car parking spaces. They have to uh, say park their cars on streets or to uh, find a good uh, place to, to park their car. So uh, the transport department is now also rebuilding the planning standards on the private car parks. But Nevertheless, I think in the future, how to strike a balance in, say, providing sufficient car parking spaces and at the same time creating a good uh, environment that means to minimize the car uh, disturbance to our new development area is an important issue that we need to work together with uh, TD or other transport departments. Okay, um, thank you, Ethan. I think parking is really uh, a key issue that we need to resolve moving forward. Now, why don't we spend a bit of time to talk about that? Uh, I think you talk about people, uh, especially from the district, you know, owning a car, asking for uh, more and convenient parking space. Um, but of course, we know as a transport planner and, and those working on transport policy, the more parking you put out, uh, you will actually make it easier for people to own a car and to park their car, and it will drive car ownership rate up. So how, how are we going to balance, as you said, the, the dilemma and, and make sure that while you are, you are not taking, or we are not taking away freedom of people to own a car, we kind of educate them that, you know, how they should better use their vehicle, and if they, you know, have other better alternatives like public transport, they should actually, you know, use public transport rather than driving the cars. Now, um, 
Uh, Constant, um, do you what, what's the what, what's the way out in Singapore, for example, or in other cities, as far as you yeah. know? Well, I can see that they convert uh, in Geneva. They've converted double lane into single lane. So, uh, the more parking and the more roads you build, the more traffic you generate. So it's basically completely reversing the trend and you have to reduce the number of roads and parking mm. that is available. And it's about converting these into alternative modes of transport. And I mean, I've seen in the slides, you know, advocating and promoting cycling and, um, and pedestrian uh, walking. Uh, it, it should be a lot stronger than that. It should be the priority. Mm. Uh, so it's, it's public transport and pedestrian walking and, and, uh, and cycling and scooter. Mm. That would be the backbone of, of, the, uh, of the developments, I would say, and, and, and have uh, roads as, as few as possible. Uh, you know, in Singapore, for example, they've developed uh, a, a new master plan uh, for the transit between Kuala Lumpur, you know, high-speed rail between Kuala Lumpur and Singapore. And uh, the roads um, have been minimized uh, in this huge new development. They say, well, we want to, to have people walk and cycle. Uh, so, and then you, when you see the new development, very few roads, very, very few roads. So it's, 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 it's really this, this change. And, mm. and if you make it nice with you know, greenery and so forth, then people will enjoy it a lot more than, you know, driving a, a congested car a, in a congested area then trying to find a parking. Mm. So it's a change of, of, of mindset and, and also making the access to MRT stations very attractive, nice. Uh, I know that existing ones are sometimes a bit difficult to find uh, in, in Hong Kong. So, but you, you know, it's a big, may, making it attractive, let's put it this way. Mm. Okay, uh, thank you, Constant. Um, Steve. Um, access to MTL station and also parking uh, with your TOD development sites. Um, you, you talk about uh, parking requirements, uh, planning requirements. So in Hong Kong, actually, I think there's a, is it a minimum requirement? Um, so you have to provide a certain number of parking lots based on, you know, uh, GFA. Uh, whereas you mentioned in London, actually it's zero and you have to certify the need to have parking. Um, yeah. Do you think it's, it could happen in Hong Kong? And if, if that's the vision, uh, how can we get there? I think um, we don't have to go as drastic as in London. Mm. In Hong Kong, under the planning standards, we do have a discount. When you are within a very close distance to the station, you don't have to provide the full, uh, uh, according to the uh, full standard. But... Um, Obviously, if you provide less parking, you encourage more people to go uh, through the network uh, by, by public transport than uh, driving. Um, I think we have to find a balance uh, between zero and, uh, and now. Mm. In London, they build very little new roads, so the road space is very limited, and to encourage cycling, they even uh, reduce the road width to make room for cycling. So in Hong Kong, I think um, we have to, 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 to look at the new situation. People really want to, for health reasons or for environmental reasons, they like to walk and bike and, and using scooters to go to the station. And that uh, there may be room for the parking standard uh, for development around the station to be reconsidered in the light of this. Mm. Okay, uh, thank you, Steve. Um, Ivan, um, then is it fair to say that probably it's a right time to review some of the planning standards and requirements based on the discussion we have so far, like uh, parking requirements, like a connection um, or integration with other transport modes, and how to make uh, everything more accessible? Is it, is it the right way to go? Uh, for, for the parking standards, uh, Transport Department is now doing a study to, uh, to going to rebuild the current parking provisions, taking account of the aspirations from the community. 
As for other planning initiatives as embodied or as, as put forward in our new development areas, I think I, I, in the past years, I think we can also, I can also, I have also seen a shift in our uh, planning uh, objectives, uh, taking account of the changing aspirations of the community. Say because of the uh, what type development, what type developments of the high-rise buildings, the government or the the government has introduced the building height restrictions to control the building height or introduce some uh, building guidelines to control the the building form. Um, for the uh, new development areas, we also see the need to facilitate the same. Uh, mobility of the future residents there. So as I said before, we concentrated the, the, uh, the future population or the commercial activities within the, say, the station area. Also, we also note that the, the, not the adverse or maybe the impact arising from the car usage or the roads. So we also, for the new, for such new development areas, in particular, the, say, the town center, we take away the road. We try to create a car-free environment. That means we try to move the roads to the peripheral area to ensure the people will have um, uh, easy accessibility within the different clusters of activities. And also another pointer from our Hong Kong Tool Field Plus is the, we see the need to encourage the people to move. So we, we advocate the need for active design. Active design in, in the sense that we encourage people through the land use planning or the physical design of uh, different uh, developments to encourage people to walk or to cycle instead of using uh, transport. We are now doing a study. We hope to come up with some pointers so that the government uh, can make reference in taking forward such an active design, which is very quite popular in, the, in other overseas countries. Okay, um, thank you, Ivan. I, I think you know, it is great to, to learn that there are so many studies going on and hopefully you know, some of those will be able to implement uh, in Hong Kong. Now, Constant, um, I, a, a different but related question. You know, um, in, in your work on urban mobility or your colleagues' work on urban mobility, how much of your work is associated with education or awareness raising you know, because we, we talk a lot about, you know, different aspirations. Uh, aspirations or expectation from the community could be different from the government's point of view at a very strategic level. How we can, you know, balance uh, uh, or to, you know, minimize the differences and to move forward together, I think we have to do it partly through uh, education or, or briefing or, or training and co-learning. So, um, yeah. how much of your time is spent on, on that? Uh, so, I, I, so, so we do some workshops, uh, but it, it's more about uh, sharing good practice and companies collaborating. Uh, and I can give you one, one very specific example is what we call a corporate mobility pact. So this is, we bring together companies who commit to actions on sustainable mobility for their own employees. So this is about training the employees of companies to change behavior and also commit to, for example, switching to electric vehicles. Uh, because it's a chicken and egg situation. If you want to become more green, you say, well, you need to have the demand. But then if you know, big companies, uh, they, they, they do have new fleet, uh, but if those companies do not uh, commit, then uh, you don't create a demand. So those corporate mobility pacts is, is bringing together um, the private sector to do training on, for the employees on how to change behavior, you know, public transport and so forth, but at the same time also make commitments on, you know, we are going to, to shift our fleet to electric vehicles. So if you have a big enough group that tells this to the government, then the government will say, well, actually, we are going to you know, accelerate the investment in, in electric uh, you know, charging stations because we know that we will have X millions of kilometers <laughs> by those, those uh, 10 or 15 large companies. So, so that's a kind of education that we do uh, within companies, but also between private sector and, and the government. Mm. Do you think that is ex uh, effective? We, we, we have done this uh, in, uh, in Lisbon to start with, uh, in Portugal. 
So we have, had, uh, I don't know exactly how many number of um, companies, but it, it has been signed with, between the mayor of Lisbon and a group of, of companies. And we are extending this corporate mobility pact in other cities as well. So we, that's something that can be done also in Hong Kong through BEC, um, you know, bringing you know, the private sector for education of employee behavior mm. and a commitment uh, for this. Because I just want to, to say, you know, um, car makers are making commitments to only produce electric vehicles, you know, Daimler and others. Daimler committed 50% of all car sales in 10 years will be electric. Singapore are now in, have 1,600 charging infrastructures, charging stations, they are planning for 28,000. So the space planning, you know, from, from your colleagues on the panel, you, you have to incorporate this somewhere and it could be in the building. So instead of having parking, it's charging stations in the building. So hence you have to look at building regulation and GFA uh, kind of provisions on this. I'll stop here. Okay, thank you. Uh, but that's a very interesting sharing. Now, um, Steve, um, have you been engaged in any like conversation with uh, other business partners or um, with uh, the community in your TOD project? And do you think that's an important step uh, in, in the process? Um, yes, of course. That um, all the TOD projects have to involve the, the public. Otherwise, uh, it's very hard to go through and get government's approval. So uh, down to grassroot level, talking to people who live nearby or district council, uh, and then um, various groups before we can build up more consensus how to improve the project such that uh, it would serve their needs. So it's part of the whole process of uh, engaging, I mean, of the, uh, engaging the public into the um, scheme design uh, process. Mm. Okay, thank you. Now, um, this session, we, we talk a lot about pe being you know, uh, people-centric and people-centric planning. I think one important element that people concerned about that we haven't touched on yet is safety. Um, now, um, Constant, I, I, maybe I will start with you first. In terms of, you know, not the technical part of you know, road safety, but more from the planning side, um, how do you think that as an important component of a people-centric, you know, planning approach? I, I think, you know, uh, safety is, is quite a complex uh, and, and very different solutions depending on what type of safety you're talking about, road safety, mm. safety on how to access, you know, uh, MTR stations, uh, you know, is it clearly lit? Uh, do people feel safe. Uh, I think that that's a, that's a uh, how do you say, uh, uh, surveys that can be made, uh, you know, according to which configuration or which design uh, of, uh, do you feel safe to mm. access an MTR station? You know, mm. Is the minimum lux that you need to have or, or minimum width and that you need to have or length in corridors or tunnels mm. uh, to feel safe. Uh, and then it's all about your know, accessibility, mm. uh, also you know, those who on, on wheelchair and who have difficulties walking, uh, you know, those kind of, so, so the safety aspect is very specific to what type of safety you're looking at. Mm. Then you have higher safety, you know, if you have bat if you move to, towards more battery, mm. uh, electric vehicles, uh, you have the, fire safety issue. So again, another set of safety. So I think, I think really to, to look at uh, the different elements um, separately. Okay, uh, excuse me for not making it clear, but I, I, now, um, let's say uh, in Hong Kong, uh, Ivan, you mentioned uh, Hong Sui Kyu as an example. You know, you try to plan fewer road in the you know, district or, or the uh, district, district center or the, in the community. That would obviously help in terms of you know, uh, minimizing the direct contact between vehicles and people. So that's one aspect of, you know, uh, uh, you know reducing safety issues through planning. Now, uh, just another example in Barcelona, I think, they have what they call the super block. 
and they try to again, you know, uh, design the space in a way that uh, vehicles are you know, entrance will be limited, and the space will be you know uh, given back to the people. So actually, um, kids can play safely in the neighborhood area without the worry of being run over by vehicles. And of course, even if vehicles are being allowed into those areas, super blocks, there will be you know speed limits, and there will be other you know subtle design elements like speed bump to make sure that the area is in general safe. So do you think this is something Hong Kong should also look into? I'm sure a lot of the road safety and traffic safety experts has been advocating a similar concept uh, for Hong Kong. So maybe I'll start with Ivan and, and then Steve. Um, do you think this is feasible and is it worthwhile to, to look into that? Uh, I, a quick response to, to your question is that apart from those mentioned, that, that means we minimize or reduce the road space uh, within the main urban course. We also try to segregate the uh, pedestrian flow from the vehicle flow. Mm -hmm. In terms of, say, we have a uh, comprehensive uh, footbridge network, like in Changguanlu, uh, New Town, uh, we have all the very good network to connect the people from one uh, residential uh, development to another and then to the MTR station. And also another issue is the development, the use of underground space. Mm. I, I think it is also quite a challenging task, in particular in our future planning of new development areas. Should we go for a good underground network? That means we can allow people easy access from the MTR station underground and then go to the different activities within their areas. Uh, but uh, another point I just uh, want also want to mention is that uh, uh, in the old days, or nowadays, uh, maybe in Hong Kong, we still dictate by the safety consideration. So we have all the, say, the, the physical design, like the, uh, uh, one example I want to mention is the uh, vertical seawall. In our past days, in the reclamations, we have the vertical seawall, and then we have all the barriers. Then the people can have a good usage of the waterfront area. Mm. But now we also try to, whether we can allow some flexibility or scope to change or to, to, uh, to update this design. So in our Dongchong reclamations, we will adopt a eco shoreline design. Mm. That means the people will have access uh, to the to the sea. Mm. So we try to somehow uh, strike a balance to safety and a good design. Mm. Well, but, but certainly, you know, to do that and to do that in the right way, you have to uh, engage with the people, right? Because at the end of the day, they are the users. Okay, Steve, uh, can you share some lights? Um, I think TOD developments offered good opportunities for good pedestrian uh, design. Like in our largest TOD development, the Lohas Park, it's quite amazing that we connect all 50 towers through a pedestrian network, either elevated level or a ground level through the shopping mall or open space. And that serves serve a very good purpose of safe pedestrian. I mean, people don't, don't have to even to cross the road because they can use the network. And I'd like to bring out the point of um, uh, not mobility alone, but mobility or beyond mobility, like in Tongchong, that uh, the station entrance is connected to a, a, a retail footbridge to go to the other side of the road mm. because uh, the development site is separated by the, uh, the, the motorway. So um, planners uh, can use the in uh, innovative I ideas to, um, with a retail bridge to in incre increase the attractiveness so that people would very happily cross the road and then go to uh, where they live. Okay, uh, thank you, Steve. Now, um, as we are entering the, I would say, the last mile of this session, I would like to also talk about first mile and last mile of you know, transport planning. Now, um, because even if we can put together a very good you know, uh, design, a sustainable design, but how to facilitate, facilitate people's access to uh, public transport interchanges or a rail station or a bus stop. I think you know, that, that's also a very important part of that you know, uh, holistic planning. How we can make that first mile and last mile uh, you know, user-friendly um, without actually creating uh, additional environmental you know, impact 
uh, that would be you know brilliant. Um, so in Hong Kong in particular, and I think similar in Singapore, because we use a lot of public transport, but very often, like with railway, they don't you know uh, bring us directly from our home to the destination. You still have to make that first mile from your home to the rail station, and then take the you know take the rail for the long distance travel. And then while you are getting to the um, the station, you have to take off. And then you still have to walk maybe for five, 10 minutes to get to your final destination. Very often right now, people use you know, uh, mecha mechanized transportation for that first mile and last mile. Of course, then we are using more energy. We are actually creating other issues. Now, planning and cycling for the first and last mile would be great, but it requires you know, good planning and coordination. Um, constant. Um, is it the same situation in Singapore or, you know, I don't want to only focus on Singapore because you have lots of experience with other cities as well. But just can you tell us how, what is the best way based on your knowledge uh, to, to make the first and last mile a better experience and better in a sense, you know, for, for a sustainable system? Mm. Well, um, I mean, in, in Singapore, they, they have similar to Hong Kong, your KPIs on, on covered walkways because you know a tropical country you have a lot of, of rain. Mm. So I think they've increased the uh, the number of covered walkways to connect uh, the housing estates to the to the MRT as it is called here. Uh, the other uh, aspect is you know, scooters. You know those. Uh, uh, unfortunately, a lot of MRTs have very little space here for cycling, parking, uh, bicycle, and, and scooters have been uh, banned. Uh, those who do not meet a certain you know, safety criteria for, for the battery in Singapore. Uh, you know, in Europe, I see a lot of uh, bicycle parking that is included in the train station planning. So, <clears throat> so that uh, you, you, know, you, you can actually park your bicycle. <laughs> Uh, and, and this is just nascent here in Singapore, but if you go to Holland or to other places, bicycle parking is part of the station design. Okay, okay. Um, in Hong Kong, what, what is the situation? Uh, like uh, bicycle parking uh, outside the MTR station, um, is it something that uh, the MTR can take care of or is it something that you have to work with the government? Increasingly, uh, we provide more uh, cycle parking. Like in the new Taiwan station, actually, it's incorporated into this, this shopping complex that there, is, there will be some quite a large number, like maybe over 100 uh, parking spaces for bicycle. So increasingly, I think um, uh, for new stations, like in Hong Sui Q, Tong Chong East, I think uh, to meet the requirement in the new era, we have to have more of that kind. Mm. And, and Ivan, is it part of the uh, planning standards and, and guidelines? Uh, is it a requirement or is it just like a voluntary requirement to provide you know, a parking space for si bicycles? I think for bicycle within uh, individual developments, we have the standards. But I think for the uh, st stations or the PTI, I think it depends on the case by case. Mm. Say, uh, as mentioned by Steve, uh, I think it, there, there should be as much scope for better planning of the bicycle parking spaces in the Hong Sui Kiu or new stations. Mm. And also, uh, just to go a little bit further, is uh, for the Hong Sui Kiu station, we will concentrate, I say, as I said before, 90% of the population or the commercial development within the, say, the 500 meter within the station or the uh, EFTS station, the environment environmentally friendly transport services. So we aim that the people basically can use either walking or cycling to access the stations just from the uh, residential or the, say, the office area. Okay, mm. okay, thank you, Ivan. Um, Constant? Can I just add something that you see in Europe is, in Europe, in some cities, you're allowed to take your bicycle in the mm. train during off-peak, of course. So depending on the hour, but that also means that the station itself needs to be bicycle friendly to be able to carry uh, the bicycle. And then, and then the, the, you know, the train themselves have some reserved space 
that is designed for bicycle. Uh, so that, that's also something that you see in Europe that I have not seen here in Singapore and elsewhere in Asia. Mm. Okay, actually in Hong Kong, you know, we also allow, you know, in, in some cases, bicycle, but they have to unfold, well, actually, they have to fold the, the fold up the bicycle. Uh, right. And I, I don't think there, there are any time restriction, actually, but... Um, that's that's yeah. true, yes. Okay. They have to, to uh, take the uh, wheel out. So okay. Make sure they cannot cycle within the uh, train. Yeah, so it's not uh, <laughs> it's not very straightforward, but still, I you know, as I commute every day from time to time, I, I you know notice there are people bringing the bicycle onto the train as well, but but not yet uh, you know on buses. You know, in in Europe, you know, buses they have a rack uh, either be in front of the vehicle or uh, at the back of the vehicle, but that's not what we have here in Hong Kong. So uh, I think it's different. Well, that, that's not very convenient because you know, it takes time to put the bicycle on. So, uh, you know, buses is, is too complicated. Okay, okay. Now, um, maybe uh, moving into perhaps my last or last two questions. Um, I think we, we talk a lot about, uh, uh, you know, a people-centric uh, approach for urban and also transport planning. I think we already have some elements of, of that approach. And from Ivan's presentation, it seems like our vision you know, uh, for planning long term in Hong Kong, also you know, uh, converge very nicely with this approach. But you know, what are the major challenges, Ivan? If you would like, uh, if you may share, to move forward with this approach to make it happen. I know, you know, we talk about you know working with other stakeholders. I think we have to have a lot of uh, you know conversation uh, engagement. But you know, other than talking to people, maybe in terms of infrastructure, in terms of planning we also have to maybe take it to the next step. So um, what would worry you the most to, to take this forward? I, I think one of the issues that I, we need to uh, pay attention is the long time span of our planning and the development process. Say to use the case of the Gudong North uh, NDA experience. We do the planning uh, starting uh, date back to 2008. And the first population intake will be uh, 2024 or 25. Mm. That means start the long road of the planning and implementations. We need to uh, allow flexibility of our system or planning system to cater to the changing circumstances. That means uh, in case of uh, the new technology or new developments, our plan should be able to cater to the, such a change, uh, changing uh, scope of the development. And the second issue is the uh, coordination or the implementations uh, amongst the government departments. Mm. You know, uh, we do the planning by the planning department or led by the development bureau, but uh, down the road to the implementation or take up the, in particular, the maintenance and management issues. That is uh, like the, uh, say the, the road will be taken up by the highways department or transport department, and the open space will be taken up by the uh, LCS, LCSD. How our planning uh, will be in the form uh, they will be likely to take up the maintenance and management by these uh, departments. Need to uh, sort out uh, uh, amongst the government departments uh, throughout the long time span of implementations. Okay, um, and Steve, uh, as uh, you know, um, as a private sector, you know, what, what do you see the role of you know private sector uh, moving forward? Um, in Hong Kong, actually, the provision to um, give people good mobility is quite good, okay? You go out of your door, you short, have a short walk, you catch a minibus or bus, you can go to the bus interchange next to the station, catch uh, the train, and then you can go within the network. The trouble is, when you get to the bus stop, the bus takes 10, 15 minutes to come, or when it comes, it's full. So it's the ICT that we have to work, work on MTL, in fact, by ourselves, we have been doing, uh, or, or we've been trying our best. If we've been trying our best, but we do need to work together with the bus company, minibus company, to use the ICT, the, the information communication technology, to make sure that when we go out to the bus stop, one minute later, there would be a, a minibus with a space for me to get on. So this part, Hong Kong, is so far not very strong, and there's a lot of room to improve to coordinate between different operators and uh, through our technology. Mm. 
Okay, now actually uh, in session three, you know, we will have the opportunity uh, to talk about ICT and other innovation that will help, uh, you know, and enable uh, the development of, uh, of urban mobility and sustainable mobility basically here. Now, um, Constant, I will give you the last word. Um, do you have anything to share based on what we have discussed, especially in terms of you know, uh, collaborating uh, among different stakeholders and you know, how to take this approach forward? Yeah, so, so thank you very much for giving the, the, the word. Um, in Singapore, you have this whole of government approach you know, because you have different departments and each of them have you know, their own priority and so forth. But now they, they think we should be moving to a whole of city approach that mm. includes the private sector. So having the dialogue between the private sector through VC or your plat similar platform and, 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 the, and the government and government agencies, I think it's critical, not only to solve you know, the, the, you know, the data uh, issue, but uh, you know, develop new business models and to really engage in, in a constructive dialogue between the private sector and the government. So collaboration would be my last word to this panel. <laughs> okay, that's a nice word. And I think this is you know, really critical. So with that word, um, thank you again, uh, Constant, for, for joining us from Singapore. And thank you, Ivan and Steve, for joining us uh, you know, on site here. Now, um, to the audience, later you will also be directed to an online questionnaire survey. So please kindly fill it out and submit it to let us, let us know your thoughts about the conference so that we'll improve uh, in our next event. Now, this session uh, will now close. If you have registered for session two, please use the unique link email to you to log in again. Session two will start at 11.30. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs>